This is the best server that I've ever built. It's got plenty of horsepower, DDR5 RAM, five NVMe slots, four SSDs, dual 25 gig networking, and all within a power efficient 1U package. Now you'll notice that I didn't say it's the perfect server. I said it's the best, because while I do think it's the most well-rounded system you could build right now, there are a few compromises. So here's the thing, fellas, I never really planned to do this video. And if you've seen my channel, you may recognize this chassis as the ones that I use for my three node Proxmox cluster. And you're right. But recently those systems have become a pain in the ass. So I'm replacing them. And while I do have 42 U worth of space in my rack, I still don't want to take up more space than necessary. So I wanted to keep the one U form factor. This has pros and cons. Well, more like pro and cons. The pro is that it doesn't take up much space. The cons are that you have to get creative to ensure that the system can be properly cooled and fit all the hardware that you need. Since I was already married to the idea of reusing these 1U chassis and I didn't want the sound of jet engines coming from my garage, that meant that the CPU would have to be something modest. These were previously running some low power Xeon D1521s, which were fine, but I wanted a bit more power. The other thing is that I wanted built-in graphics in case I wanted to do some transcoding. This would also allow me to avoid using a dedicated GPU, and we'll see the benefit of that soon. I eventually settled on the Ryzen 5 7600. It's $200, it's got six cores, 12 threads, 24 lanes of PCIe Gen 5, built-in graphics, and is modestly power efficient. There is actually another reason I went with not specifically this CPU, but AMD in general. I had a trick up my sleeve. In one of my AliExpress videos, I purchased a PCIe card that takes a regular X16 slot and turns that into an X16 physical slot with eight lanes and dual X4 NVMe slots. But this only works if your motherboard supports bifurcation on the PCIe slot at 844. If you can't do that, then it won't work. Well, guess which consumer platform supports this? Yep, AMD. Surprisingly, they support this on a ton of chipsets. So I went with the B650 platform and this ASRock B650 MPG lightning board because it was basically the cheapest one. And yes, I actually planned my entire build around like a $30 PCIe card from AliExpress. But man, I think it was worth it. The board itself has three NVMe slots, Four SATA ports combined with the two additional NVMe slots from the PCIe card gives us nine drives. Hilarious. Now all those NVMe slots aren't created equal. The top one is a PCIe Gen 5x4, the middle is PCIe Gen 4x4, and the bottom is PCIe Gen 4x2. Then the other two on the PCIe card are PCIe Gen 4x4. Do whatever you need to do with that info. I threw a variety of drives in there and even used an M.2 to U.2 adapter to hook up this Micron Enterprise drive. The chassis by default supports dual two and a half inch drives, so I used two SATA drives to have a mirrored boot setup. Then I got another dual two and a half inch caddy off of Amazon to put at the top to give me space for two more drives. So yeah, that's eight solid state drives in here. In a 1U chassis, that's pretty slick. And yes, I know they make 1U servers specifically designed to fit plenty of storage, but this chassis with a 315 watt power supply included was only like $180. You can't beat that. And of course, since we have a 1U chassis, that means we are very limited about cooling options for our CPU. I initially tried to go with the thinnest normal cooler I could find, but it was still too dummy thick. I eventually settled on this Dynatron A15 specifically designed for 1U chassis, and it works. So the biggest problem here is that the part that makes contact with the CPU is one big flat piece of copper, which means you have to be careful about how much space you have around the CPU socket. Depending on your motherboard, you may have VRMs, capacitors, or heat sinks in the way. I knew mine would be pretty close with the capacitors above the socket and well, they were just barely in the way. So I just cut some of the copper back with a Dremel. Yeah, maybe I could have just found another board or I could have just went with a 2U chassis, but I already had a Dremel and like, it worked. Even with proper contact though, the idle temp is around 50 degrees. This initially had me pretty concerned, but when I fired up Cinebench and stress test the CPU, it only got up to around 85 degrees. Yes, that's kind of high, but it's not high enough to thermal throttle, which is all I care about. Oh, and this is with AMD Precision Boost Overdrive turned off because I don't need all that. I probably could have gone in and undervolted it a bit, but I'm comfortable with where it's at. 
Speaking of Cinebench, we scored a 12,347 in R23, which is well within the range of what I'd expect out of this chip. I really don't plan on stressing this processor too much, to be honest. If this ends up being my new cluster build, then they'll be sitting basically idle for the most part unless we fire up some transcoding tests with Plex, Sandbrake, or Owncast. As for the RAM, it just has a basic 32GB DDR5 config with two 16GB sticks. There is room to add two more if I want, but I think that's a good start. And technically, the board supports up to 256GB, so that's tight. Now, if you're not impressed enough, we still have our dual 25 gig NIC. That eight lanes of PCIe Gen 4 we have access to gives us 16 gigabytes per second or 128 gigabit per second. So yeah, we could have snuck a 100 gig NIC in here, but A, that's expensive, and B, that's way too overkill. I mean, who the hell needs 100 gig networking in their home lab? That's some like turbo nerd shit. I kicked around the idea of what to even do with this PCIe slot. I was thinking of adding my ARC A310 or maybe even more NVMe drives, but I figure with a bunch of high-speed storage already on here, we may as well add some high-speed networking. And dual 25 gig is a nice compromise of being high speed, but low price. I mean, 25 gig is just over three gigabytes per second, which is about the speed of a nice Gen 3 NVMe drive. And we have two 25 gig ports, so I think we're good. You may have noticed that the card sits a little funny here in the slot, and that's for a few reasons. One is because the slot on the chassis doesn't line up with where a regular X16 slot is on the motherboard. And two is because apparently with these Connect X4s, the half height bracket is like upside down where it connects to the chassis. I'm sure someone has an answer for this, but whatever. So yeah, it kind of just sits there, which doesn't really bother me. It's not like this server is moving around. One thing I am giving up here that I had on my previous system is IPMI, which let me access and control my machine over the network. This actually came in handy all the time since those pieces of shit kept breaking and it's just an awesome feature to have in general. You don't really see this on consumer level boards, so obviously this one doesn't have that. Now it doesn't mean there isn't a fix though. I got sent this Jet KVM, which is a tiny KVM that connects to the PC's USB and HDMI ports, then to my network and lets me access the device over the network. Now, at the time of making this video, it's wrapping up its Kickstarter and holy shit did it blow past its goal. And I can see why. The build quality is insane, the screen is a super nice touch, the software is clean, fast, and functional, and it's open source. For $69, the price is freaking nice. I'm 100% gonna buy two more of these if I end up building two more of these systems. And of course, you don't need network access, but I think it's worth it. So how much did all of this cost? Well, the chassis, motherboard, CPU, cooler, RAM, PCIe card, and 25 gig NIC was right around $700. I didn't include the storage, not because I'm trying to be sneaky or anything, but that part varies so wildly. Like you could spend $50 per drive or $500 per drive. It's really up to you. And notice I never said this was a budget build because I'm well aware that $700 is still a good chunk of money, but I think for what you get, honestly, it's hard to beat. It's powerful, thin, not too loud, and only sips around 50 watts. Is it the prettiest server in the rack? Well. No, but it's got character. The idea here is to deploy this with Proxmox and run some of my apps in parallel to see how it performs. And depending on how that goes, we may build two more. And right out of the gate, it's hard to say what I would do differently if I had to do it all over again. I guess maybe have someone give me a reality check and tell me to just use a 2U system, which would have made things way easier. But like, what's the fun of that? Let me know down in the comments what you think. What would you have done differently and why is that the wrong decision? If you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe if you wanna see where this project ends up going. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my one you dummy thin server that's super quiet, power efficient, and has space for 10 SSDs. Y'all are the best. And if you're still watching, you're bifurcation. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.